My name is Sahar Aziz. I am a law professor and a Chancellor Social Justice Scholar at Rutgers Law School in Newark, New Jersey. I'm also the founding director of the Center for Security, Race, and Rights, which is the first civil rights center at a U.S. law school that focuses on the civil and human rights of Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities in the U.S. as well as in the diaspora in Europe and abroad. I'm also proud to be a fellow at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, the cutting edge think tank that focuses on law, public policy, public health, and many other issues that disproportionately impact Muslims in the United States. During these troubling and challenging times of a global COVID-19 pandemic, it's now more important than ever for us to work together to make sure that minorities are not scapegoated. Not only Muslims, but Asians, immigrants, African-Americans, Latino communities, because what we've learned from history, most recently during the September 11th terrorist attacks and before that with multiple national emergencies, whether they were related to terrorism or war or the 1918 influenza, is that the public is seeking to misdirect its anxiety and its frustration and sometimes even its anger at someone. And minorities tend to be the easiest and most vulnerable groups to direct that anger at. And oftentimes politicians who have failed in providing good governance and addressing the national crisis in a competent way are eager to also point the public to those minorities to redirect the blame from the government where there has been in fact uh, failings and shortcomings and mistakes made to minorities as a means of uh, not having to be held accountable for uh, mistakes in governance. So we're at a time right now where we need to be very alert, we need to stay informed, we need accurate information, and we need to make sure that we engage in or conduct research and advocacy such that we do not allow our communities to be easily scapegoated and that we also ensure that this is a time for unifying the nation because if there's one thing that's very clear about this global pandemic it's that it doesn't discriminate it doesn't matter what race you are what ethnicity you are what religion you are uh, whether you're an immigrant or not whether you're documented or not whether you're a citizen or not where in the world you live it simply doesn't discriminate and this is the time for us to unite because it's in the human race's interest to work together to make sure that people are do not unnecessarily get sick, do have access to health care, quality health care if they do get sick, and do not unnecessarily die due to a lack of health care. So one of the things that um, I do in my research is look at the ways in which law and policy disproportionately affect uh, Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. So most recently, I co-authored a piece with Khaled Baidun, who's also an ISPU fellow, called Fear of a Brown and Black Internet Policing Online Activism that's forthcoming in the Boston University Law Review, and you can find it at www.ssrn.com and search that title. And in that article, we discuss how particularly after 9-11 and also after uh, the Black Lives Matter movement began and during the protests in Ferguson, the way in which the government criminalizes dissident uh, activism and protest and political association by Muslims and by African-American communities, some of whom are also Muslim, through surveillance of their social media, through surveillance of their uh, online activism, and how they use their political speech to send informants and undercover agents to ensnare them in sting operations and to effectively try to entrap them into some form of prosecution or perhaps even an attempt to 
seek out if they have any immigration problems so that they can deport them if they're immigrants. So these are very real problems. They are not simply exaggerations or they are not uh, playing the race card, but there are very real civil liberties at stake. And there are people who have in fact been harmed, whether they are currently incarcerated or whether they've been deported uh, or whether they are facing discrimination in society. Uh, these are very real problems that we know existed before the pandemic and we are concerned could get worse after the pandemic. And one of the things we've already seen during COVID-19 is uh, President Trump and other Republican uh, leaders uh, engage in very irresponsible and malicious uh, spreading of false information that mosques are super spreaders of the COVID-19 virus, which we know is absolutely false. They did so first by incorrectly stating that mosques were still holding services in person in large numbers such that it can in fact uh, increase the spread of the COVID-19 virus, but there were no such gatherings. And in fact, mosques were among the very first houses of worship to instruct their congregants that all khutbah and all Friday Juma prayers would be conducted online and they continue to do so. But again, this is their attempt to misdirect, redirect the anger from the public and rightfully placed anger because the government has not handled the COVID-19 pandemic well. The testing has been in, uh, insufficient. There hasn't been a quick response. We have no contact tracing and the list goes on in terms of the way the federal government has mismanaged the COVID-19 pandemic. But alas, this is part of the minority scapegoating that goes on in any national emergency time. Now, one of the things that my center is currently working on, the Center for Security, Race and Rights, is looking at how the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is affecting Muslim communities and tying that into how it is affecting Asian communities and African-American communities and looking at the cross-racial connections to see uh, whether there are opportunities for us to work together uh, with other communities. Because one of the interesting and positive developments of the post 9-11 era has been this coming of age of a new generation of immigrant Muslims or children of immigrant Muslims realizing that the discrimination that they face as Muslims or on account of their Muslim identity, regardless of their level of religiosity, regardless of their ethnic background, regardless of whether their skin is white or not, or white looking, is that the racism and the bigotry and the prejudice that underlies anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia is the same prejudice and racism and bigotry that drives anti-Black racism, that drives anti-Latinx racism, and that drives anti-immigrant xenophobia. And that in fact, many of these communities have more in common than they have apart. And that you can't honestly and responsibly and effectively combat anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia without working with other communities who face uh, other forms of bigotry and discrimination that may manifest in different ways, but have the same roots and usually are perpetuated by the same uh, nativist groups. And so as we've seen this rise of the alt-right, particularly after the election of President um, Barack Obama, the first African-American president of the United States, we saw a huge uptick that continues of these white nationalist groups, of these white nativist groups, some of whom are misrepresenting Christianity, some of whom believe that it is Christianity that uh, legitimizes their pro-white and anti-brown, anti-black, anti-Muslim agenda. And so what, we, what we've seen since 2008, and make no mistake, much of their Islamophobia is in fact anti, thinly veiled anti-black racism. And so there's certainly a, a convergence of anti-black racism and Islamophobia uh, that, that has been taking place. And so what we've learned is that we can't sit on the sidelines and that they have many targets and the targets may change based on the particular circumstances, but we're all in this together. So I hope that those of you who are listening 
are engaged uh, at your own personal level, at the local level, state, or even federal, and making sure that whatever advocacy you do on behalf of Muslim communities or Arab or South Asian communities is always connected to other ethnic and religious minority communities, including Native American communities, because what we're seeing uh, today is that all vulnerable communities are being hit very hard by the inequities in our society, both political inequities, wealth inequities, but also uh, norm inequities, norms in terms of the, the stereotypes, the negative stereotypes against these groups that then results in not getting the same level of attention, the same level of uh, investment, and the same level of care by the state entities that are tasked with dealing with this pandemic uh, and this national emergency. So some of you are younger than I am and you are still in high school or maybe you're in college, uh, maybe you're still in law school and I hope that by listening to me, reading my work and also listening to other ISPU scholars and their work and ISPU's work that it motivates you and it inspires you and it makes you feel the obligation to do something positive and make sure that uh, by the time you reach uh, an older age or if you uh, decide to have children and grandchildren that the world will not be as prejudiced, as bigoted, as discriminatory against uh, Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians. And first, that is exactly how you should feel you should feel a sense of obligation. You should feel that I have to do something. I will not stand on the sidelines and complain. I will not stand on the sidelines and just read and say, oh, that's interesting. But I will actually get into the game. I will get into the trenches and I will be part of the solution. And there are many ways that you can do that. Uh, the easiest way is to volunteer your time to an organization and make that a lifetime commitment, that you always allocate a certain amount of time, of your free time, towards a volunteer organization that is conducting or, or pursuing an agenda that you believe in and that is worth your time and that is doing so effectively. Uh, the second way of doing so, once you are employed and have some additional income, is to donate money to those organizations who are doing so. It's, it's critical that you um, see yourself as financially supporting those entities. And one of the problems we have, unfortunately, with the Muslim American community is that we do not see the value of donating to think tanks and nonprofit organizations and advocacy organizations as important forms of zakat, the way that we do feeding the hungry, uh, providing shelter for the homeless, helping those who are victims of domestic violence. All of those things are important and all of them should be uh, targets of your investment uh, over a lifetime. And finally, some of you may say, no, I want to go farther. I want to commit my career. I want to commit uh, my life's work, which is something that I certainly have decided to do. And it has a lot of challenges that come with it. You have to have a very thick skin. You have to be able to withstand criticism and withstand attacks and not let people take you down and know and stay focused on your goal and your objective. And that in itself takes training. But what I would recommend is the first and foremost that you get professional training, whether you're going to go to law school, which is what I decided to do, or perhaps you'll go to a public policy school, or perhaps you'll go to journalism, or um, some other professional training that will allow you to commit your life's work in a way that is competent, uh, zealous, and high quality. And there are many, I won't go into the, the numerous programs available, but in addition to getting the professional education and the professional training, I highly recommend you also get mentors. And mentors of people who care about you and who will commit their time to helping you uh, aspire and achieve your goals. And then as you grow older and more experienced, you will do the same because the most important thing is that you always have to lift as you climb. You don't want to fall for the trap that many minorities communities fall into, which is the crabs in the basket phenomena. And that is a direct result of oppression. It's a direct result of the inferiority complex that comes with being a racial, ethnic, or religious minority that comes from being a colonial subject. And so 
don't let that trap your mind. You have to see yourself as someone who is part of a much bigger community that is rising together or falling together, rather than crabs in a basket that pull each other down so that no crab ever reaches and gets out of the basket. So lift as you climb. Uh, don't be embarrassed to climb. There's nothing wrong with being ambitious, particularly if you're a woman. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being assertive and with being smart and with being confident, especially if you are a woman. And this is advice I give to any woman, regardless of her ethnic, racial background or nationality, because patriarchy is a global phenomenon. It has different forms and different degrees, but it is something that as a woman and as a professional and as a mother, is something we have to face and we have to confront. And we have a lot of male allies within our family and within our communities that will help us to decrease the level uh, of patriarchy uh, in our societies. Uh, but in closing, I encourage you to stay informed. I encourage you to read and to be critical in your thinking. Don't believe anything I say. Don't believe anything one individual or one organization says read multiple sources and triangulate, come up with your own ideas, because that is really the key to informed citizenry and to having a society that is pluralistic and a society that isn't self-destructive, but rather builds and grows and evolves. And each of you plays a very important role in that. Um, and if you want to keep up with the latest work that I've done, you can follow me on Twitter at Sahar Aziz Law. You can follow the center at RUCSRR or join our newsletter by going to csrr.rutgers.edu. And you can also follow my scholarship, which is a little denser, but something that I hope uh, you will find informative at ssrn.com and Google my name. Uh, thank you very much for everything that you do. Thank you for supporting the Institute for social policy and understanding. And thank you for having the courage to do what is unpopular, but necessary during these trying times, because we are all in this together and this is home for us. And we will not let other people destroy our homes. We will not let them speak for us and we will not let them oppress us. Thank you. <laughs>